I want to introduce you to five characters. Chloe is recovering from depression. She lost her job about a year ago, applied for another job and got the job, and then wanted to get promoted and didn't get promoted. And things got pretty bad for her, but she's recovering. Susan is a student, and she is the first in her family to go to university. Her grades are good, but a little bit variable, and her tutors think she's great and huge potential, and she's thinking of dropping out, thinking of leaving university and abandoning her objective of becoming a biochemist. Rachel and Raymond are married, moved to a new city about a year ago. Rachel and Raymond both got new jobs, that's why they moved to the same city. And it hasn't gone well, they don't think things are right, and they're thinking of leaving. Bob owns a large trading company, does a lot of work with charities and social enterprises, and he is not sleeping at night because he doesn't know whether to get involved in a takeover or not. They're all true stories, but fictional characters based on real experiences, things I've seen over the years. All of these situations, individual mental health, running companies around charities, students at university, marriages, are also like things in the media we hear nowadays, distress and challenge and things not going well but individuals and couples and organisations dealing with those challenges, improving, thriving and recovering. But it's not easy. When we look at it, it looks very different in those different contexts. My proposition is that understanding the way in which individuals recover from depression and from anxiety helps us understand other forms of unhappiness and other forms of distress and how to improve the life situation of other individuals and of couples and yes of organisations and society in general as well. Let's look at depression. The clinical evidence is very clear that although each individual person is different and each individual's experience of depression is different, and although there are multiple complex, immediate and long-term causes of depressive episodes, that the best way of helping a person who is depressed is to work out with them what is maintaining their depression. It would be good to know what kind of caused it, but we all react in different ways to negative life events. But when that reaction becomes extremely intensive and recurs and maintains itself, then clearly there's something we can do. We can focus not on the cause, but on the activities which are maintaining that type of depression. Depression is a vicious circle amongst much else. When we are feeling low, when our mood is bad, because of what's called mood congruence effects. When we are feeling sad, we are more likely to remember sad information from the past. When we think about the future, we're more likely to think about negative possibilities there. And that makes us stop doing things. It makes us much less active because we don't want to see what is out there. We expect it to be bad. Chloe was like this. When Chloe was interviewed for a job and didn't get promotion, two or three of her work colleagues also didn't get promoted. And for a week or so, they all felt pretty fed up. It was a really golden opportunity, fantastic chance to get promoted in a, a growing company. Chloe's two friends felt fine after a month and shook it off, because some people do that in different ways. But Chloe didn't. Chloe thought about the fact that this probably meant the company felt it made a mistake when it hired her. Chloe felt that everyone in her area would know that she was feeling rejected. Chloe felt that in the future, if she applied for any more promotions, she would also get turned down. These are aspects of unhelpful thinking. This is not about right and wrong. This is not about saying to someone, your thinking 
the wrong things. It's about helping individuals understand how they can look at their environment and use their best intellectual ability, their best knowledge to make the decisions that are right for them. But when you're not at your best, the biases kick in. When we are not feeling well, we see things in a more negative way. Same with anxiety. When we're feeling anxious, we start to cognitively look for more threats. Evolutionary terms means that in the past that was a strong defensive mechanism. Because if there was a possibility of being attacked, then you wanted to make sure that you were not attacked. There were no grey areas. People suffering from anxiety tend to significantly overestimate the probability of pending negative events. They also significantly overestimate the consequences of those events. They also significantly underestimate their ability to cope with those negative effects if they were to materialise. They also, interestingly, significantly underestimate the ability of other people to cope with their own negative events. The way we feel about things, particularly the way we feel about ourselves, impacts on how we think about things. And that's what creates the vicious circle. The low mood or anxiety generates certain types of thoughts and not others. Those thoughts effectively validate our feelings about the feelings that we have. So it's not a system of feelings that is perpetuating the negative experience. It's thinking about the situation and how that drives further feelings. Too many people around the world and in this country suffer from depression and anxiety, and most of them aren't getting the support that they require. One aspect of tackling this is around cognitive therapy. It seeks to alleviate psychological stresses by correcting faulty conceptions and self-signals. So faulty conceptions about the world and self-signals taken from your own body. You feel your hand shaking, so you think this must be a threatening situation. By correcting erroneous beliefs, we can lower excessive reactions. I like to put it like this, though. Everyone in the room thinks I'm dumb right now. Source, everyone in the world ever. We all have that experience from time to time. At some point in our lives, we just think we are the dumbest person in the room because we've said one thing that wasn't quite right. And yet the chances are that no one heard it or didn't see it as being the wrong thing. And if they did think it was imperfect, it's not going to make them think of you as being the dumbest person. That just won't kick in. We all do it. But if you're depressed or anxious, you're more likely to do it than at any other time in your life. But understanding those processes, I think, can be applied more generally to make sure that we can connect with those systems which perpetuate a bad situation, be it in terms of mental health, education, working with a charity, or in a relationship. I want to go through some of the specifics of aspects of unhelpful thinking styles. These are all, if you will, mental errors. There are things that we do, all of us, very regularly, which mean that we are not making a full understanding of the world around us and our future in a way that's going to be helpful to us. And I want to emphasize, we all do this very regularly in different parts of our lives. But when an individual, or a marriage, or a company, or a national conversation is in a bad place, with bad feelings, bad attitudes, bad, and by which we negative and restrictive ideas, it generates ways of thinking which perpetuates the bad atmosphere that triggered it in the first place. All or nothing thinking. This is when we walk around thinking that either things are fantastic or awful. Some people have it just momentarily. Others have it almost all their lives. I am either perfect or I'm a failure. And I want to find out which I am by going to university. Now that kind of binary opposition is very dangerous, of course. And it's also false. There are any number of shades of grey between those two possibilities. Susan has that. Susan was told 
by people around her in her community and in her school, in her school, that she probably isn't the right sort of material to go to university. There was a risk that you, she would fail. Others said, no, look, you've got tremendous potential. It'll be hard, but you will be a success. You will achieve all sorts of things. Now, for all kinds of reasons, Susan incorporates this as, well, who's right? Am I a failure who shouldn't be at university, or am I brilliant? If you live your life under all or nothing thinking, every waking moment is like walking along the edge of a cliff. Walking along the edge of a cliff. And every feeling you have about the future is a feeling about what it feels like after you have fallen. Who would want to live their lives along a cliff edge? It's true for people who suffer from depression. It's often true of students in education. It's true of marriages. It's true of companies. Overgeneralization. This is where we extrapolate inappropriately from one instance to a much bigger set of ideas about the world around us. In evolutionary terms, if you ate some berries and they made you sick, you wouldn't just avoid that particular location, you probably would avoid the whole hillside because you couldn't afford to take risks. But nowadays, you meet the new person in your workplace at your new job and they seem unfriendly and you think, this must be an unfriendly company. The first tutor you meet seems to be really quite demanding and challenging. You think they're all going to be like that, for better or worse. You might look outside your window. It's a bit like this. You look outside your window, you see a yellow umbrella. You think, oh my goodness, all the other umbrellas are going to be yellow too. It must be, wear your yellow umbrella with Pride Day. What am I going to do? I don't have a yellow umbrella. But of course, it's not like that. But when we are not at our best, we are blinkered. We filter out all the things which are going to give us a more balanced point of view. Labelling. Susan's labelled herself. She's labelled herself as a failing student. Despite evidence to the contrary. Now, she's not depressed, and she's unlikely to become so, though too many students experience depression and anxiety across the period of their education and subsequently. But she's just becoming pessimistic. And if you're a learner, one of the biggest challenges you've got isn't managing time, because you'll get the hang of that. And it's not about navigating the complexity of the syllabus, because it's written to help you, and you'll get good tuition. The biggest danger, if you're a learner, is pessimism. Because it will drive your perceptions of other things, and you will start to filter out the things that make you optimistic. It will fuel itself. It is a vicious circle. There are many other things. Disqualifying the positive. I mentioned Tilton. <coughs> This is where maybe a student gets a good mark, but they say, well, it's a one-off. The question on the exam paper was actually really quite easy. The mark I got was a reflection of the fact that I happened to be quite interested in that, in that area anyway, and I spent the whole week weekend looking at it. So it's not a fair summary of me. I'm a failing student. Jumping to conclusions, catastrophizing. Jumping to conclusions is when we think we can read the minds of other people. Susan thinks this. She thinks not only that she is a failing student, but because she's jumping to conclusions and catastrophizing, her, her thoughts are, I'm a failing student, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. And she's wrong. People don't think she's a failing student. So. One of the other ones, emotion-led reasoning. This is when we have a feeling and we say, well, that tells me about the world. People say, trust your gut instinct. Well, maybe, depends on the context. But trusting your gut feeling, your gut doesn't have ears or eyes. It's getting its information from your mind. And if your mind is filtered, then you're going to get the wrong balance of information and your gut feeling is not to be relied upon. Always ask ourselves, what feeling do I have right now? And what thinking has
has led to that particular feeling. And the things I've been thinking about, are they balanced and fair? Am I using all the evidence? Am I subjecting myself to discounting the positives? Am I subjecting myself to filtering out all the positive information? Am I subjecting myself to all or nothing thinking? Should and must setting high standards and personalization? When we go around all the time saying, I must do this, and I must get that, and I should do that, and I shouldn't get that, it's like a voice in our heads constantly criticizing us. So we start to walk away from all the things that can get us through the difficult times. And personalization. Something has gone wrong, and it's my fault. Often things haven't gone wrong. And if they have, it's probably not your fault, not in any simple sense. So let's think about how this works in terms of education. I've been doing some research recently in terms of what I'm calling study thinking errors profile, which is to say each individual learner, be they at school, college, university, or doing advanced professional exams, has a tendency towards engaging in different aspects of those 10 unhelpful thinking styles. Everyone has a little bit, and even if they're not using it, it's not changing how they feel about things, it's there. And I think the first step is to help us understand and to help individuals understand what their own profile is because it points out your Achilles heel when it comes to difficult circumstances. We're all going to meet difficult challenges in our lives and some things are quite bad and we respond dis with disappointment. It's fine, it's being alive, it's being human. We can cope. But if we have negative thinking styles, there's a risk, a real risk, that we maintain the vicious circle. The first tactic is to find out what our profile is. And the early results that I'm finding do support that aspect. A lot of work still to do. In relationships, Rachel and Raymond. One of the interesting things about unhelpful thinking styles is most of the research literature focuses on how one person may have a certain bias, a, cer a certain mental tendency for all or nothing thinking or for uh, catastrophizing. A and that's true. And individuals in a relationship, you can have one person who's more about catastrophizing and another person who's more about um, all or nothing thinking. And, and that's, that's fine. It's interesting when they come together. But what I think isn't really been looked at in the clinical literature or in the research literature quite so much, and I think it's important that we do look at this, is the fact that some of those unhelpful thinking styles have two or more components. For example, personalization has two uh, components. Number one, that something bad has happened, and number two, that it's my fault. Also, emotion-led reasoning. I feel anxious is the first component. That means this must be a threatening environment, the second component. My proposition here is that in relationships, particularly when maybe they're not going straightforwardly, like when Raymond and Rachel moved house, I can imagine a situation where Raymond says to his partner, I feel really nervous at work when we have these meetings. First component, emotional reaction. Rachel says, well, it must be a very threatening environment for you then. On their own, they wouldn't have got to that conclusion, but they contribute in this tangle of thinking the different components required. So dealing with each individual to help them understand wouldn't get them as a couple too far. But I think understanding that what it is they're sharing, what it is that they are collaboratively creating, is an unhelpful thinking style. In the media, we have heard a lot recently about fake news. Websites, etc., that publish news articles which still damage even long after they have been shown to contain factually incorrect information. But I think we miss the fact that newspapers and websites use forms of unhelpful thinking styles to get us to adopt a certain position. For example, all or nothing thinking, and let's say an immigration debate, which has those binaries of, of us and them, good and bad, which side are you on? In business, when I've done consultancy uh, for private, public, and other uh, types of companies, I do see examples of unhelpful thinking styles again. Clearly, individual people, like Bob's company, working with charities very closely. Uh, individual people in business at all levels are human beings, and they have different types of unhelpful thinking styles. But 
Companies also can have a thinking style. In Bob's business, two major directors. One was risk averse, the other was risk enterprising. Their voices were strong and they drowned out the other voices. That company, for a long term, felt just like all or nothing thinking. That binary dominated the company and they lost their way. But I don't think they ever realised that what was going on. They saw it as two points of view and they had to make a decision. So what can we do? Let's think about the fact that we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and look at the world around us through our available lenses. Let's think about education. In terms of assessment and feedback, we've got to change our thinking about it. We've got to innovate in order to educate. I think it's ironic that when students get feedback on essays or projects, we give students just enough information to trigger their unhelpful thinking styles, but not enough information to help them deal with it. Because I think student support from this point of view is more than just those important things of empathising, providing general support, and maybe additional targeted skills development. It becomes really interesting, but it becomes asking students, OK, you got 55, how do you feel about that? And they'll tell you. And say, well, what thinking got you to that point? And it'll come out. Well, because I know that everyone else in the class got more than 55. Really? Yeah, because the tutor said that everyone had done really well. Oh, wait a minute, that's not necessarily true. Susie's had this problem. She labels herself as a failing student. And when she gets a good grade, she thinks, well, that doesn't really count. I just happen to get a good question. If you sit down with Susie, it's quite straightforward. You can show her that she's been doing really well, that she's on course for what she wants. Her life ambition is to become a biochemist. She needs a 2-1 to get to do the master's or the PhD. And she's well on course for that. She's been thinking about it the wrong way. The other big thing we can do is look at ourselves. We must be careful not to collude in the unhelpful thinking styles of others. And this happens all the time in clinical practice and in education and in businesses. People try to be nice by only giving a positive feedback or giving a positive story, which has its place, don't get me wrong. There's far too much criticism and negativity for its own sake. But the question is this. The question is this. How do we help individuals and couples and companies and people engaging in the national debate in terms of the news understand what thinking got them to their position? None of that is easy. It's quite hard. But it's definitely worthwhile. And I hope I've shared that with you today to convince you of that. Thank you very much indeed.